I would like to introduce to you our first speaker of the seminar. He is an eminent writer, a philosopher, one of the well-known voices of Manipur, author of many books, including Perspectives on Manipuri Culture, and Chairperson, Center for Philosophy, Jawaharlal Nehru University. He works on philosophical anthropology, sociocultural philosophy, ethics, and aesthetics. In addition, he writes on indigenous knowledge, conflict, and identity politics in the Northeast India. Please welcome Professor Bhagat Oinam. Let's acknowledge him with a round of applause, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me in this August gathering. And I must uh, put it on record, my sincere thanks to this, I believe, newly formed organizations, uh, Manipuri Diaspora of Chandigarh. And I can see many old friends, seniors, uh, all in this hall, and also the students. Uh, is I was sitting and also seeing uh, the organizers calling all of us from JNU. So it's like uh, ex importing three people from Delhi to here, but two of them are from JNU, I am not. Basically, I belong to Punjab University. <laughs> I, I did my graduation from government college, what you call GCM in sector 11. And I spent quite a bit of my 12 years of my life in Chandigarh in Punjab University. <laughs> so whatever I am today, I owe it so much to this university and my teachers. And in fact, let me begin by saying that those teachers who met me what I am today, more than the Maitais, it is either a Punjabi, a Himachali teacher, a Marathi, a Bengali who has made me what I am. That is what India is all about. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really, really privileged to come back to my, it's like a homecoming. It's time I come inside this campus. I can see, go into that, mem down the memory lane, See the Stutsi you call student center, so much of changes. This very hall in which I am standing right now, and during my PhD days, I organized a Manipuri dance recital here. And all those memories really brings me back here to claim that I am from this university. So that's what I am here before you. Uh, Today what I wish to do, and my learned colleagues are here who had been writing, speaking at different forums on the present issue that we are facing in Manipur. Uh, what I will try to do to flag off the discussion, I will talk more about perspectives and discourses of what is happening. Uh, not so much into the details, because by now, you, if you Google it, if you have a watch up with you, just you Google and YouTube and there are plenty of it. Perhaps all for the wrong reason perhaps, but Manipur has become one of the most popular reason in India right now. It is talk of the town anywhere perhaps. You go in across the country and everybody is talking about, at least the middle class intelligentsia are talking about Manipur. Perhaps not for very good reasons, but nonetheless, a friend of mine who is a journalist says, there is nothing called bad news in media. Any news is always a positive news. So let us hope that uh, this also is a way to uh, make Manipur known to the world and what it has gone through and also what it can be. And that is where I wish to 
submit myself. Uh, it is now the fifth month of this violence. And the uh, one or two days we think, oh, it is silent. Perhaps the violence has slowed down. Suddenly there is a firing. There is a burning down of some villages here and there. So this sporadic, what you call violence, is continuing and perhaps may continue for some more times to come. And this is some, from someone who is closely watching it and who have also spent one month in Manipur going to the nooks and corners of where people were all uh, struggling, suffering. So that's how it is. But what, what I wish to bring before you is there are so many stories with each of this, what you call the pictorial, the videos, uh, small watch of messages. These are not merely a messages. These are all narratives. It, it's of these statements that you see. It's of the visuals that is shown to you. Even a small photographs that is being shown to you, it doesn't come out of blues. It comes with a purpose and it is part of what I call a storytelling. And this storytelling seems to be so multiple now that many a times we do get confused. And it is bound to be get confused because the players are many, narratives are many, sometimes complementing one another, sometimes even contradicting one another. And I was thinking and discussing with a friend, saying more and more you watch and see what is happening in Manipur, it reminds me of Kurusawa's, what you call, Rosomon. Something that happened. Someone died, a woman who is alive, and a bandit who is, who is caught. And there are different stories. In the front of the, what you call, ju jury, it tells a story. It, it's, it's just like that. And even happened, uh, continuously it is happening, and our stories are telling and retelling, and countering of stories by one another. Not necessarily among the cookies and maites, but among the cookies themselves, and among the maites now, among ourselves. And this is more and more intriguing as you go by. And let me begin by saying a statement. Recently, 28, now it is 32, MLS, member of Legislative Assembly from Manipur, has come to Delhi, stationed there. I had an opportunity to meet one of some of them. And they are saying, till the Home Minister, Union Home Minister says something, we will not go back. And perhaps we may even resign. Some of them have started meeting. And Union Home Minister says one thing very interesting. This is yet again, I say, a part of a narrative. And that is, we respect the Mayra Paibis, the Imas a lot, but you have to control these women. So unless the women are controlled, we can't do anything. In, if the Maiti women are controlled, within 10 days, the violence can be subsided. What do you draw from this statement? It, it turns over the table, up and down. So it looks like everybody is telling a story with certain purpose, with certain agenda. And we seem to be dragged down onto this. Somebody X has said this, Y has said that. And why? How? And this is the mind boggling with which we are entangled with. And perhaps that is where I want to, uh, what, I draw from my philosopher uh, Wittgenstein who says about letting the flies out of the fly bottle. Philosophical discussions are nothing so great except that you let the flies which is stuck in the fly bottle to go out. We are all stuck in the fly bottle right now. Fly bottle with full of narratives and we are just in this scope where we are lost and we need to come out of it. And we need to search for a larger, grand narrative which makes sense, which is more holistic 
and which comprehends. And that is where I'm just trying to target. If you remember, up the 3rd of May, soon, maybe two or three days after, India's Chief of Army Staff, Defense Staff, CDS, declares in Pune, when a journalist encountered him, saying that this is nothing to do with insurgency. It is all about ethnic conflict. Even before the issue has really triggered off, there is a statement from the army. I'm sorry, there are lots of army officers, but we all respect army. Because of them, we are so comfortably standing and talking here. There are 60,000 defense security forces, including army and paramilitary forces in Manipur right now. And hopefully, they will do something, a miracle, which has not happened for four months. In the fifth month, hopefully, something happens. But the narrative of ethnic conflict comes by. Then quickly, there is another narrative that comes. And I have noted down 11 narratives that is being floated out. Narco-terrorism. So those cookie militants who are up in arms into violence, into throwing this, dethroning what you call the present government, are all engaged into narcotics and they are armed. And this illicit trade takes you into narco-terrorism and it is a threat to the whole country. This is another narrative, a strong narrative. Then you find suddenly a group of the Maitis who think that every problem that Manipur has today can be solved if we are given scheduled tribe status. Once you give the Maite settled tribe, land issues, conflict, everything can be settled down. ST, we must get, that is the core. And comes the tribal groups from the hills who says, Maites cannot be given ST status because they are more privileged, more advanced than us. If you give them, they will eat away our jobs. And they will also come up to the hills. So ST demand, counter demand is a yet another narrative that comes. Then you have this conflict looking at what you call striking to our national sensibility. This is what cookies are claiming, that our centenary gate, which is a symbol of our resistance to the colonial force, the British, against whom we fought in 1917-19, were attemptedly burned down. It was not burned down, somebody tried to burn it down. And that is a challenge to our national aspiration and sensibility. Till now, there is no proof who has tried to burn this. Some miscreants, it could be anyone. It has happened, is a fact. Who has done it? Nobody knows. But Kuki says, Maite have done it. Maite says, we have not done it. This is what I say, the Rosomon phenomenon. It is telling a story. Event happened, but countering one another. Then another thing that is very interestingly, after all these issues when no confidence motion was brought up in the parliament, Union Home Ministers categorically said, after all this description that, that he makes, that the whole issue comes from illegal migration. And the next moment is all the cookies are up in arms, saying that this is not the way. We are not illegal migrants. We are son of the soils. We are indigenous people to Manipur. So the whole issue of what is illegality and migration, and there are even some professors who will say there is no migration. This boundary of between Myanmar and India is a fictitious boundary. People skips and going and coming. The same story with in Bangladesh people say that, you know, my relatives in, on the other side and I am in India. So Bengal is moving up and down. The Qing Kuki groups moving up and down. And the rules also allow 16 kilometers without any restriction you can go. 
Anyone from India can go 16 kilometers down to the Myanmar and 16 kilometers they can come inside India. So where is the migration? And this is our ancestral land. This is the colonial forces which have somehow forcibly drawn a boundary. So we don't bother about the Indian boundary. This is another narrative that is going on. Then another challenge that Maitis are saying right now, yet another one, is once you abrogate, stop this sue, suspension of order, the agreement between the armed cadres of Kuki Chin Jo community, parties, groups, with government of India, things will be settled down. And there are many who is saying, who are saying that Cookies and Joes, militants, have never fired. They also claim that we are, we have never attacked the Indian army. So one group, the groups that are no threat to the Indian state, is there a need for an agreement? This is also one argument that is going on. Why the need for Sioux? I can understand that if you are having a Sioux agreement with the Naga militants, because they are a havoc, they are unnecessarily going to create hazards to the Indian security forces to ensure the life and security of our army and jawans and paramilitary forces. You go for an agreement of suspending operations, violence attack to one another. That is the very logic of what you call suspension of operation. But the group who has never attacked the Indian state forces, what was the need for an agreement? So this is yet another narrative that is going on. The eighth one I see, and this is very much in the talk, within a larger circle among the Maitis, and I don't think the Indian state is so seriously taking it, is a question of Jalengam. That Kuki Joe nation, particularly started from uh, the, Mr. Haukim, on this whole idea of a kooky nation. And all we know is there are scattered population of these Chin kooky groups in Myanmar, in Bangladesh, in India, particularly in Mizoram and Manipur. So they have an aspiration for a consolidated country to come by. So people are arguing and sowing, it, it is always there in the social media, that Indian state should be very cautious about this. But I don't think Indian state takes it very seriously. The other one with a narrative that comes is, largely it is the military junta, whenever there is a military rule in Myanmar, the minority communities, ethnic minorities, in Myanmar are targeted. And Chin groups who are residing in the Chin province are always a target of the military. And they also target each other. And many a times they flee to the Indian side. So illegal migration, what you call, is largely a result of what you call uh, what is happening in the neighboring country. So once the problem is settled in Myanmar, things will be settled in India, in Manipur. That is another narrative that keeps going on. There is also another aspect which I will go a little more seriously, that is on the territoriality. The whole issue burns down to the territory. And this is something which they are also claiming, the Kuki Chin groups, Maitis are also claiming. The difference is, that for the Kuki Chin groups, they want a separation of the territory. That means breaking of Manipur and creation of whatever they call an administrative, a separate administration. Whether you call it state, union territory, or you call it an autonomous district council. Even here also I have heard many, many scholars and activists within the Kuki Chin groups differing with one another. Even one of them, uh, confessing in the interview, saying that, well, claiming of a state is too small. So we should look for something more uh, practical. On the other hand, the Maitis claim that Manipur's territorial integrity must be intact. 
It ne should never be broken up. This seems to be a status quo that Maitei had been trying since the Nagas 18 June in 2001. And it has not solved. Sometimes it is the Naga from which the threat comes. And this time it is from the cookies the threat comes. I don't know what the Maitis have been doing except our claim, slogan for an inseparable Manipur. How much we have done in the last 20 years has shown the result that nothing has happened. Same problem has started, this time a different player. But challenge to the very idea of Manipur in its territoriality is what is constantly coming up. So one needs to really see this very, very seriously. And the 11th one I see is another, uh, which is very much in the media, and particularly international media, is the Hindu Christian class, the religious class that has been shown that Maitis are Hindus and Kukis are Christians and minority Christians are being targeted and they had been liquidated, their churches burned down, so on and so forth. This is what the narrative you can see. And you spend so much of your time to overcome, to counter this narrative. And this is what is happening at this point. Now, my submission to you is, apart from all this narrative that is doing around all this while amongst us, I wish to bring before you three questions, and perhaps from these three questions, we can try to look, locate ourselves, our problems. One is how it all happened. And when I say how it happened, it's a question of the event that took place. The events, the sequence of events that took place, this is one. And from there, you derive into who are responsible for this. From the events, we have tried to draw and arrived at the perpetrators of violence or those who are responsible for this. This has been largely the case. If you see the entire May and June, this has been happening. And you will see that in this how question, May 3rd, it happened. The cookies started burning down expelling out the Maitis from the cookie-dominated areas. Many temples burned down. Then on the fourth again, you see that the Maitis is retaliating in the Maitis-dominated areas. So many churches being burned down. So this whole idea of, and one reminds you, you don't have to talk much about it in Punjab, in Chandigarh. You have had a long history back, partition of India. What has happened in the entire population being shifted from Punjab, the Muslim population to that side, and Hindu and Sikh population from there to this side, you have had a terrible, terrible story. And that memory, the scar is still not healed. Still people talk about this. And same thing is happening, though in a smaller scale, right in the front of the Indian state. That is something worrisome. My friend Bimol has been working, he had worked on this, on partisan, I think with Professor Asis Nandi. And that partisan narrative of the violence that happened, people being dislocated and made to move out and create a new home, and that is what is being cried out in this place. Little do we know that from 1947, 2013, 23, things have not changed much in this country. Now my submission to the audience here is when we engage with how this event has happened and pinning down the responsibility, those groups who are responsible for escalating this huge problem, we are missing many things we get lost into the events of what really happened. Some people will say on 3rd May, the cookies started. The Maitis will say. Then the cookies will respond by saying that, no, on 2nd May, you stopped us from 
organizing a peaceful rally then maitis will again go back and say on 28 april you started burning down the effigies of the prime minister and chief minister burn down the whole gym so there is a counter and points and counter that is happening and this is not going to take you much into the real crux of who are responsible because as i see in terms of events that happened on 28 april 3rd 2nd may counter block it 3rd may 4th may 17 18th if i am not mistaken when was the new parliament enacted it was in 18th i believe or 19th i'm i'm just forgetting i still remember on the television screen i was seeing prime minister installing the sengong the sacred you know scepter of righteousness with chanting vedic mantras and on my left hand side i was watching my watch of youtube messages of hamaiti house is being burned down on the same day when prime minister was putting down the scepter of righteousness in the par new parliament building the several of the houses of the maiti villagers were burned down and many of them most of them are scheduled caste communities their houses villages were burned i was looking at the irony that myself being located in delhi getting the best of the positions that one can have and torn up a visual of two a celebration and the pain the violence and celebrating righteousness and what is happening the injustice here and i was asking to myself my goodness what the hell is this going on and you can keep on talking about the events then what happens is i was reflecting to myself that more and more you talk about events this come and lock the cookie will say you might is invaded killed our people then we will say you killed our farmers who were going to the paddy field by shooting from the hills and what ends up with this looking up how events are happening is only it boils down to the maitis and cookies and the entire problem seems to be located with the animosity of the two communities called maitis and cookies and i keep hearing many maitis saying some army colonel who is saying that the buddy the closest uh sepoy who is supposed to be next to the right about close bodyguard of the officer the buddy you call is a cookie can you imagine this a maitai officer saying that the buddy who is next to me most reliable person is a cookie soldier how does it explain then and i also heard a cookie officer revenue officer irs officer who tells me whose house is perhaps burned down and who is working in delhi station in delhi coming out from the meeting he says you know i am born and brought up in imphal my parents my grandparents bought land we built houses i have lots of maitai friends i can't imagine my life without the maitais look at this at the personal level there are so much of closeness but at the collective level the discourse tells you something else the paradoxes and that makes me think that perhaps how these events are unfolding is a bad question to ask it is not the right question as a student of social science but as you have to look for other questions and that question is i say why questions should come why such a thing is happening and when i say why it is not targeting on the event per se but reasons behind certain events and first thing that strikes me of why such a thing happened is that can you imagine or those of you non manipuris who are sitting here those who are maitis already know about it is that maitai manipuri maitai insurgents are quote and quote harbored by the myanmar's government i don't know how true it is but it is a fact that 
Maithi insurgents, when they were pushed out of Manipur, many stayed in Bangladesh, many stayed in Myanmar. Quite obvious, you go to the next country. When the relationship between Bangladesh government and Indian government goes well, all of them were arrested, including our chief of the UNLF, who is now in Imphal, who have served jail terms. Still there are insurgents on the other side. And without the support of the state there, how is it possible the insurgents would be staying in those Reason, this is an obvious question people will ask. Now, can you see this? That if this is the case, how is it that Kukichin insurgent groups who are fighting the military junta are staying in the Indian side? So, you have been against me, you have been against me, you have been against me, and you have been against me, and you have been against me. This is simple political diplomacy logic. And you don't need a rocket science to say this. You don't need even a person like me. Anyone who is reading will know. So, Chin Kuki groups who are fighting the military junta are being harbored in this. Secondly, please note it down that in, the, in this year itself, there has been several strikes against the Chin groups by the military junta in Myanmar. And there is a story of these people coming to this side to India, in Myanmar, uh, in ba uh, Mizoram and Manipur. You also know that there are Chin Kuki groups, I'm using the word with hyphenation, this, you call, what you call Kuki this side, they say Chin in the other side. In Silet province in Bangladesh, there are settlement of the Chins. And recently in the last two, three months, there were a military attack onto this. And in all possibility, they must have come this side. But why the Indian state is allowing this to happen? If the two foreign countries are striking to their insurgents, and they are coming this side, and this is not my concoction, Latin journal, Ellen Singh himself has said, tweeted that lots of insurgent groups have come to this side. I put a full stop here. My point was that Look at the larger international politics that is going on. So it is the way we are talking right now between the cookies and chins. It is not about cookie and chin here. It is an Indian sovereign state. You have a Myanmar state. There is a Bangladesh. And involvement of the three cannot be doubted. There has been news report that Indian Army Chief visited Bangladesh and Bangladesh Army Chief visited India in the recent, in this year itself. And they just don't come for a cup of tea. Certainly they must be discussing all these national security issues. Now, this has to do with the migration as well. But the migration also is something we cannot completely throw away by saying that they must not come. When you have a border which is porous, when the life is difficult in the other side, and the India is a greener pasture, and so much of uninhabited land in Manipur, and that settlement is happening. And it is here that the Manipur state has not done much in order to check the number of people who have migrated, whereas Myanmar, uh, Mizoram has done it. And this is another point where it is not only the Kuki and Maitai, but the state government who is responsible should have done the job of really checking the people who have come, establishing building camps, allowing them to stay in a particular area. This has never happened. They all mingle with the communities. This is also one, unfortunately, our state government has not done enough. Because this is also a story, I don't know how true it is, that when the new migrants come, the old cookies, old inhabitants, they vacate their village, allow the young, newer ones to settle, and the old one creates a new uh, village. Because creating a new village is not such a big deal with the cookie communities because of their nomadic uh, character. So this is another aspect 
I would like to see. And what about the drugs? Do you think it is only the, the cookie communities who are cultivating opium? True, it is largely cultivated in the cookie dominated areas. There has also been in the Nagar areas as well. But what is important is who are those who are really responsible for this? And it is the rich elite class who can be cookies, who can be Nagas, who can be Maitais, who can be Manipuri Muslims, who are into this drug. Some poor farmers among the cookies are being, you know, charged. Of course, they are responsible, but more responsibility lies with the elites, the drug cartels that is involved. This nobody is talking about. Though there is a talk about it, but it doesn't go inside. I'm sorry, again, the army officers are here. But armies, when they go to Manipur, they also play the devil's role. In the individuals I'm talking about. One army colonel was caught with 18 crore drugs in Palil area. This is on record. So there is a deep nexus. A deep nexus between the politicians, the army, the security forces I'm talking about, and even those who are cultivating. So there are some in vested interest groups who are involved in all this, and we need to go into that. And let me also make another point here, that is it a sporadic event on 3rd May that something happened and it may they responded? No, there are much more deeper games that has been played out. And that game, I believe, is not only the cookie elites, but others involved. When we were struggling in the May, second week, third week, people were all fighting out how to write an article to respond to this letter, uh, articles published in the newspapers, the Maitais I'm talking about. There are series of articles that have come up. Even happened on third, and subsequently it is coming up. Even it has been said, how true, I do not know, that one of the top officials, Kuki officials, in government of Manipur, very close to the present chief minister, he vacated his bungalow one week before this event happened. Did he have a premonition? Did, we have, did he have a premonition that something is going to happen, so I'm vacating myself and going to Churachandpur? My submission is, it is not a coincidence. There could be a well-planned strategy about how things are happening. Look at the way the letters are written to the European unions, letters written to the church confederations, letters written to the prime minister of Israel, saying that we, at the original Jewish community, had been tortured, ostracized by the Hindus of Manipur. And naturally, this, when you internationalize, then it gives a bad name to the Indian state. So, not so much with the Manipur or Maitais, but it is against the Indian state. What is coming from the Christian lobby is against the Indian state because you already have a particular notion about India in the West that Indian state, particularly the present government, is largely a Hindu-dominated Hindu political party. So that kind of a, you know, propaganda that is going on. So my submission to all here present, it is not so much between two communities, Kukis and Maitis. As you look closer, how things are evolving, the reasons behind all this happening. There are bigger players, and perhaps we are only the small pawns. Why I say this is, all of you know it, that when two events, uh, let me tell you, when the cookies were head on to bury their dead to Torbung Bangla, which is a contested place, Maite is also inhabited, they had been expelled out, they wanted to make a, what you call, a 
what is the best word for that, uh, for the dead to be a cemetery, but a national war memory, mem memorial. And my things were against that. But you just need one word from Home Minister, Union Home Ministers, who say that you don't do it. And like a very obedient student, they just stopped. So is the case with the Manipuri MLS. One word and we just keep quiet. So we seem to be, these two groups which the whole world is saying, Maitai and Kuki, they seem to be a small pawn in the larger players in this game. And we need to point it out. And even it will not be surprising if there are corporates involved, because the kind of trade route Northeast is becoming now, the corridor, the look is, is, is opening up. China is taking enormous interest in uh, trade transaction from Yunnan province via uh, Myanmar, going to the Cox Bazaar. Japan is interested to convert the entire region, this area, as economy free trade zone, so that they can also play their role. And even we came in the newspaper, we, came, we found it, that Godrez already have signed the agreement of cultivating palm, what do you call, trees, so that the palm oil can be extracted as an alternative to poppy cultivation. So there are so many things happening. And even look at this. Can you imagine that government of India has built the tallest railway line in the world in the northeast, in Manipur, Assam adjoining. Is it merely love for the cookies and maitis? Or it has to do with largely with the trade routes that to be built up? So perhaps, who knows, that maitis, cookies, and nagas might be seen by these big players as a nuisance creator. So they have to be settled once for all. Because this, in this middle of the crisis, Nagas also come in. Because no talk, no agreement can be settled about Manipur without the Nagas, without the Maitis, and without the Kukis. That is for sale. But unfortunate story is, Naga, Maitis, and Kukis have almost become a pawn to the bigger players that are there. Some visible, some invisible. Only way to counter this is, I don't know, is a million dollar questions. If these three groups sit down, sit together, perhaps no other fourth party can do anything. We have to settle our problems ourselves. But unfortunately, we are all the time running to Delhi. For any problem that we are having, we are looking for a fourth party. But these three communities who are the stakeholders, they are so much against each other. Nagas are very guarded at the moment. They are neither siding with the cookies, nor with the maitis. They can side with anyone at any point. And these three groups, not so much in talking terms, needs to come down and sit. Because we are being used by forces who have their own vested interests. I hope the civil society groups, those elites who matters within these communities, must think about it. That do we only go by the verdict of this union government or a Supreme Court or somebody else from Israel or European Union to decide our future, our fate? Or we have to sort it out among ourselves? Because every time you fight, you also use another word, we are brothers and sisters. Of course, Mahabharata has still told it long back, the greatest of the battles are fought among brothers and sisters. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir, for your valuable insights and inputs. Before we call upon our second speaker, I would like to make an announcement. Our respected speaker, Professor Bhagat, will be leaving soon due to some prior commitments. So if sir won't be able to stay for the QA session, if anyone has questions for him, you're requested to come forward. I would like to request Mr. Malam to assist with this.
Mr. Malam. So uh, I, I, I have heard your lectures, but your conclusion is, are we suspecting the Biden rule policy being played on us? Can you, can you uh, clarify the, and given some enlightenment to us? Sorry, I have to in between come because I have a train and to go back. That is precisely what it is very visible, even you don't need to say it about it. I mean, that is what is happening. We have lost our agency in this process. In this process where violence are being triggered through some other means, and people are sucked into this chain of violence, we have lost our agency. Only way to recover our own agency is by sitting across. Even if you are angry with, with another, you throw it to each other. You so throw your anger to the other. You should be able to listen to the other. The problem is we are not listening to one another. We are only speaking our point of view. That is what I wanted to say. Thank you. I think there is. Now, uh, small tribes like uh, Kuki, Jao, Mar, Mijos, they all got together and decided and agreed to have a united movement and have a greater civil tribe area, including Mizora. So this recently about 20 days back. So in this case, I feel this movement and conflict is not going to be uh, very soon. Uh, I, I don't think so. So what, from your side, what do you feel, what we should do? What actions okay, should be taken? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. I think it would be politically wise if the Maitis do not comment on that. Because the moment we comment on their effort to unify, saying that you cannot, then unification is for sure. So I think let us wish them good luck. But we should also tell them, see, you are better being in Manipur. Because I know many friends from Mizoram who tells me, many Mijo who are silos, who tells me that this, this community is Mar, when they go to your state, Manipur, your state, they say to the Maitis. When they go to your state, Manipur, they will say, we are Mar. Once they come to Mizoram, they can't even claim that they are Mar, they are Mijos. So if they are happy with that, let them be. But we can say that Manipur is always a plural society. Before I say I am a Maitai, I can also say I am a, what do you call that, my clan name. I am a Khuman, I can say. Then they have the seven, where is that flag? My friend Umakanta is not included here, unfortunately. This, this is the irony of how we construct our own identity. We are, Maitis are also shrinking in their mindset. Unless we open up, because we want a Manipur which is together by all to be lived by, and on that you only tell the story of the Maitis, then naturally they will like to go to Mizoram more and more. What can I say? I think there are more, yeah. Maybe one more question, others, we should listen to others as well. I want to listen to them as well. Good afternoon, sir. So in this current scenario, what advices do you want to give to the youth of Manipur? Sometimes we think that we are useless doing nothing for my motherland. So give us some advices to the youth of Manipur. Thank you, sir. See, as a student, uh, I was also very active with the students. Move, I mean, what do you call, whether you want to use the word politics, no harm, politics is a broad term. But first thing is, be good in your studies. Don't lose that out. And your love for Manipur should remain. Don't lose out in that either. But first, your duty, your responsibility as a student, as my commitment towards my parents, that should be the first. 
But then along with that, you should continue to love Manipur. It is not that you hold a gun and or you show your love better. You can always love Manipur and contribute from whichever profession, whichever work you do. And for one profession towards which we are aiming at is studying well. And let us do that, is all I can say. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, once again.